I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, the good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. Here we are continuing our um, our big victory lap as the co-chairs, co-presidents of this podcast following the Magnificast National Convention last week. And uh, our first order of duty last week was to talk about imperialism. And we're going to do it once again, but not without my co-president. You know him. You love him. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Matt Pernico. I'm on the podcast, and I'm the co-president of this party. I thought you were going to introduce me for a second, and it gave me a lot of anxiety <laughs> for whatever reason. And there's fireworks and, and air horns and confetti, and there we have it. That's right. There you have it. We're here. We're both president. We're going to talk about imperialism some more tonight, but not before announcing the, the most important thing that we've done for all of you, and that is there's going to be a new Five Iron Frenzy album, <laughs> and that's what you get. That's what you get with us. <laughs> The people who made it happen. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it has been kickstarted, and they do say the word ass in a song on it. Oh, I, I can't it. believe it. Um, I can believe it, because that's the sort of energy <laughs> that Five Arm Frenzy is going to bring to 2020. <laughs> um, I love it. I'm glad they're back. I'm glad they have a new album. I'm glad that it's kickstarted. Um, and so, so exciting. Um, but let's talk about imperialism for just a minute. We'll save the, we'll save the real Five Arm Frenzy talk for the... Uh, behind the scenes Magnificast uh, lock in that you can get on our Patreon um, only. <laughs> so that if that doesn't get you in the doors, I don't know what will. Um, I should say, though, there's a, a pretty natural connection because Fire and Frenzy does have a song about indigenous genocide, um, about Crazy Horse. It's true. They have a song about riots. Um, they have a song about how capitalism is bad called Vultures. Uh, I, it's not saying too much to say Five Iron Frenzy did perhaps have a hand in putting me on the path to the left. So what better time to talk about both Five Iron Frenzy and imperialism? <laughs> That's right. Well, OK, um, I'm going to bracket that for just a <laughs> second. Uh, la last week, as you might recall, <laughs> we talked about Christian objections to um, what you might call empire. Um, progressive Christians uh, have built a rhetoric around rejecting uh, nationalism in favor for more, you know, quote unquote, authentic and subversive types of Christianity. And while this is definitely very nice, thank you very much for doing that, progressive Christians. Um, it's not exactly what you'd call a robust anti-imperialism. <laughs> So this week, uh, we're going to deepen the conversation uh, around Christianity and anti-imperialism a bit more by talking about the ways Christianity is already complicit in empire and imperialism. So uh, Christians say they hate this thing so much, but surprise, they're already doing it. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, the critique of empire from Christianity is is complicated because Christianity is not and has never been a, a neutral party in imperialism. And as we were thinking together, Matt and I talking about this episode, we we're thinking about the previous episode where we um, we talked quite a lot about how imperialism works or what it is or isn't and all that kind of stuff. But uh, we never really got around to talking about how Christianity is a major, massive piece of that whole conversation. So we're rectifying that now by pulling it out. Um, Christianity, I mean, you can talk about imperialism in terms of global economics and you should. You can talk about it in terms of racialization and colonization and you should, but you can't talk about either of those things without talking about Christianity because it's a motivating before force behind those things. 
So maybe to sort of put a fine point on it, um, we can look at this historically, but in a contemporary way, you could say that anytime the United States invades anywhere, uh, which is quite a lot these days, you're already dealing with the imperialistic tendencies that U.S. politics inherits from Christianity and with certain Christian vision, you know, sometimes self-consciously so. Uh, Christianity, in other words, isn't this kind of like pure space that you could critique the world from because Christianity already has a hand in building that world. So it's up to us to figure out how to uh, critique it and deal with that complexity at the same time. Right. Um, one thing that we're always talking about on this show, ever since we learned about it from our very smart and intelligent guests like Marie Rose and Mario Armstrong or Tad DeLay and just a bunch of other people, too, um, is that it's really important to name the bad things that Christians do as Christianity rather than trying to say those people are just fake Christians. Uh, if we can't account for how Christianity has historically created certain forms of oppression or social order, then uh, we can't really get rid of those forms at all. And that that sucks. That's what we should do. <laughs> so uh, if you want to, uh, this is a, a wild cut from um, from left field, but uh, Reverend William Barber a few weeks ago said that you can't exercise a demon unless you uh, know its name. Nice. I like and there that. There you go. Just just like that. Yeah, totally. You can't get rid of these these very bad uh, forms of oppression and social order unless you know how they work and what they are and if you can see them. So um, imperialism is definitely one of those um, those big bad demons that's um, inside of Christianity, uh, that Christianity is definitely guilty of uh, <laughs> making and using and spreading. Uh, so I think if we can understand it a little bit better in the ways that Christianity as a, a big mess of institutions and people <laughs> um, have, uh, you know, is guilty of imperialism, I think we'll be better off for it. I think you're right. Um, to start off, though, we should at least remind ourselves, <laughs> for our own sake, what imperialism is and what we said about it a week ago. Uh, maybe you didn't listen to that episode, um, or maybe you need a refresher. I certainly do. Uh, so maybe we could just spend a little bit of time talking about that, and then we'll, we'll add the Christian piece, which will turn out to be not an additive at all, but a kind of necessary um, part to understand. But in any case... When we're talking about imperialism, especially if you're invested in a, a Marxist tradition, um, it's important to recognize that imperialism is a big, complicated thing that not every even Marxist agrees about, right? So we said last time that Karl Marx did a lot of work on capitalism, trying to figure out what it is, how it operates, and he did all that work in the 18th century, mostly looking at, at England, um, you know, with an interest in lots of other places, too. Not to say he didn't look at what we could call the the sort of seeds of anti-imperialist analysis, all that kind of stuff. He gave us lots of good tools. Um, but we would have to wait till people like Lenin and Luxembourg and others to really develop a, a full um, account of what imperialism is. And these days, you know, um, even long after those folks have gone, there's a lot of debate over whether or not imperialism is even a, a useful term in Marxism. And we tend to think that it is. But to figure out why it's useful, you have to talk about what it means or what's going on. So probably the most kind of the, the simplest, most naive way of maybe understanding it, naive in a positive sense of understanding imperialism would be to say that it's the the invasive cap, uh, the invasive activity of capital um, in invading other countries or other people on behalf of, you know, the ruling class uh, in a, a different country. And for that matter, too, on behalf of like the citizenry of certain imperial centers. Um, but as it does that, there are different kinds of things you can say about it. So, for instance, we might say that imperialism is fundamentally extractive, right? It goes to other places. It uh, sucks up all the value and profit that it can out of those places. And then it sucks it back into the imperial center where it might redistribute some to certain citizens, but mostly goes up to the top, right? It's not, not the case that everybody benefits from it in the same way, but there are these kind of weird, uneven um, geographies of development that occur as a result of that extractivism. So I think that's probably the first piece of the puzzle here, at least for me, Matt, when I think of it in terms of like political economy, you know, not taking into account all the sort of history and everything yet so far. That's what I'd say. It's got this sort of weird extractive piece. Um, what am I missing? What am I leaving out here? <laughs> yeah, the other thing we brought up last week was that... Um imperialism has a lot to do with colonization. Um, that was what we got from Nick Estes and um, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. Um, 
that uh, that that to extract things from other countries is definitely imperialistic for sure. Um, but you know, <laughs> you gotta you gotta make you gotta find some kind of way to make the people doing the extracting seem like it's theirs to extract, right? <laughs> you gotta make it seem like they've always been there and they just have some kind of natural right to the land and the property that used to belong to other people. So naturalization is another part of imperialism uh, where the, yeah, the imperialists uh, become sort of like the natural owners of something. That was a big part of imperialism as well. Yeah, that's right. And also it's good to bring that up for two reasons, I think. One, because sometimes when we think about imperialism, even given the way I was just explaining it, you can you can create an impression that suggests imperialism is the kind of thing that happens somewhere else. Like if you live in the United States or Canada, you think that imperialism is the thing that maybe, you know, mm. Canada does in Venezuela or the United States does in Iraq or, or whatever. Um, but there's imperialism at home and that's the ongoing logic of, of colonialism, right? The, the continued dispossession of people, um, indigenous people and their land, etc. So there's that piece of it that's important. Um, the second is that uh, imperialism doesn't operate the same way in every single context or country. So it, it has the same goal, I think, which is to extract that sort of profit. Um, but, you know, the the way that the British colonized India is not the same as the settler colonialism that colonized the United States and Canada, although they have lots of important similar logics and all that. There's also different forms of imperialist control or domination. So all that's to say, it's a really complicated thing the more you talk about it the more kind of particular you have to get in order to do justice to a specific kind of thing or situation but nevertheless um important to recognize you can still talk about it and in particular you can talk about it as that uh that sort of extractive impulse there it is it's all right there uh, so i mean there's a lot more we can say about imperialism for sure um but for right now that's probably a good place to stop at least uh as, as a recap of last week so, Dean, maybe we should start saying some new things about Christ about imperialism <laughs> and Christianity. Sure. Um, yeah, so Christians, they have a really hard time. Um, you know, they, they want to reject the idea of empire, or at least the sort of progressive Christians do. But I think they have a hard time understanding the ways that um, Christianity is really wrapped up in that empire. Um, so what do you think, Dean? <laughs> I think you're right. That's the transition to something. Yeah, great. No, I'll, I'll pick it up. Um yeah, I mean, you, you can't tell the story of capitalism, the rise of capitalism, and by extension, imperialism, without talking about Christianity, right? Uh, the the quote that always comes to mind for me, I don't even know if we've talked about it much in this podcast, but it's important in my my life. It's one of my Marxist life verses, um, is uh, from Walter Benjamin. He wrote this uh, essay called Capitalism as Religion. It's, it's more like a fragment. He like, didn't finish it. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of cool stuff in it. And he has this line I think about often that goes like this, a few lines. He says, Capitalism itself developed parasitically on Christianity in the West, not in Calvinism alone, which is what uh, like Weber says, right? The Protestant work ethic, if you know anything about that but also, as must be shown, in the remaining Orthodox Christian movements in such a way that, in the end, its history is essentially the history of its parasites of capitalism. Christianity in the time of the Reformation did not encourage the emergence of capitalism, but rather changed itself into capitalism. Um, there's a lot that you could unpack in that little bit, but I think it's really important because what Benjamin is saying is fragmentary, but nevertheless true. Like you can sort of prove the thesis if you do some more homework, I think. Um, and the basic point is, I think we sometimes have this tendency to assume that capitalism is this independent force and it emerges maybe kind of out of nowhere or, or out of a, a sort of like secular logic of, economy right like these are the economic laws that operate and they slowly disentangle from whatever catholicism or feudalism or medieval society um what benjamin encourages us to do is try to see how capitalism is is sort of shot through with lots of weird christian ideas and christian habits and it seems to me anyway that you don't really uh, see that any clearer than in the history of imperialism and colonialism as it develops um does that make sense I think it's a good way of putting it, though, that capitalism itself developed parasitically on Christianity. And um, because uh, I mean, I think for I don't know, at least in my my own uh, weird American Protestant brain, 
it is extremely hard to <laughs> like imaginatively draw the connection between like um you know the um the genocide of like indigenous people in the United States and like and Christianity like what do those two things have to do with one another but actually like quite a bit uh quite a bit if you learn anything about history um I mean we could go into like into depth about a whole lot of sort of historical movements that would kind of help explain these things but like um we probably shouldn't right now at least uh that's maybe another episode but um you know things like the doctrine of discovery right that's a papal bull that was written in 1493 um or the treaty of tordesillas that was in 1493 i think as well um the these two like these two treaties amongst others right are the ways that um like the church the catholic church particularly um negotiated land rights between different monarchs right mm -hmm. and it's wild to think that like that's the kind of power that um the that you know rome would have but they did the treaty of tordesillas is such a weird thing um it, i don't know a ton about it besides what i've read in like uh, a handful of decolonial texts but basically the idea was that like spain and portugal uh, in 1493 were trying to you know negotiate like who gets what of the quote unquote new world um you know new to them rather than like uh, uh like have a war over or whatever um pope alexander just like drew a line down the middle of a map <laughs> and was like okay here you go right and then just like that's how that that's part of that's part of that pro process of naturalization of colonialism right now like now these are the people that actually have um for whatever arbitrary reasons these are the people that have um uh, the divine right to to that to that land right and there's all kinds of other negotiations too where like blatantly christianity is like at the the bottom of the the racialization and like the you know dehumanization of indigenous people all these kinds of things uh, i guess so all i'm trying to say here is that walter benjamin is right and um he, he's right in probably uh i think a lot of decolonial theorists um a lot of indigenous scholars um you know uh have a lot more to say than Walter Benjamin even. Um, but there's, yeah, all I'm trying to say is that there's a lot going on here and that Christianity is extremely tangled up in the, uh, in the imperialism that, uh, that would, you know, go on to sort of found um, the United States and, and all of like Western Europe, basically. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I mean, like you said, decolonial theorists are really good at pulling this out. Like, um, Walter Mignolo has a, a really cool phrase that I think is helpful where he says that we we live in a Christian afterworld, um, you know, because we we live in societies primarily, at least for most of us in the West, that are like ostensibly secular in terms of legal theory, um, but like not actually or not totally uh, like there's this kind of Christian hangover or um, Christianity that's still hanging around in a weird way. Um, I, I think maybe even Afterworld is putting it too softly uh, for even Mignolo's own uh, extremely complicated analysis, right? Because um, he shows that Christianity continues to be this really formative kind of way that that makes the way that we think in general work in certain patterns um, that we may or may not recognize as uniquely Christian. Like we take them to be universal, but they're very particular. And capitalism and imperialism are, are two of those things for sure, right? They rest on certain Christian principles like the doctrine of discovery or uh, like, I don't know, valuing hard work and productivity, all these kinds of things. Um, but we sort of uh, screen them out as Christian and think that they might be something else. It's important to sort of make the genealogical link so that we can see them as Christian things. Yeah, exactly. They're um, Christian pathologies that linger that uh, we reproduce because of the ways that they're probably entangled with capitalism in a lot of ways. Um, and also, you know, in, and the ways that they support a particular racial hegemony. Um, but I think what's really interesting is, is that those things are really hard to see. Like, just like I said a minute ago, right. My, um, my American Protestant brain is, has a hard time making those connections unless I like actually listen to people who can help me make those connections. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, bring up Walter Manolo is good. Another um, decolonial theorist that I think is really helpful on this point is this, uh, he's a Colombian philosopher named Santiago Castro Gomez. He is uh, criminally unpublished in English or like maybe untranslated. He's written a lot. Um, he's written a lot, but just not in English. Um, 
So uh, w- one of the ideas that he has that uh, he brings to the table, uh, he, he the one article that he does have that you can probably find pretty readily in English is called The Missing Chapter of Empire. It's a critique of uh, Hart and Negri's book, Empire, uh, which I guess it's unsurprising why I'm bringing it up right now <laughs> as we're talking about imperialism. <laughs> but anyways, the, um, the big idea that he brings to the table is this thing called zero point epistemology. So the idea is that... Um, uh, it's hard, you know, if you if you yourself are kind of in the imperial core, if you're a person who is is there, it's hard to kind of see outside the um, the epistemological bounds of that core. Like it's hard to see outside your own worldview. Is basically what he's saying. Um, it, but it's there's also like uh, it's also helpful because it points out the hubris of that type of worldview of, of of not listening to other people and not listening to other voices and not trying to see outside of yourself. Um, yeah, here's a quote from him, actually, that kind of says it better than I could, um, because I just kind of stumbled right through it. Uh, so Santiago Castro Gomez says this, basically, zero point epistemology is the ultimate grounding of knowledge, which paradoxically is ungrounded or grounded neither in geohistorical location nor in biographic politics of knowledge that is hidden in the transparency and the universality of the zero point. Uh, he goes on to say a little bit later in the essay, the zero point is always in the present time and in the center of space. It hides its own local knowledge universally projected. Its imperiality consists precisely in hiding its locality. So the, the point here is that um, uh, there is a certain type of like official way of knowing things for, um, you know, for the imperial center, for the people who, uh, you know, are, are sort of like the inheritors of the Christian afterworld. Um, kind of in, in Manolo's terms. And it's really hard to see outside that thing because it grounds itself as sort of like the center of rationality, of reason, of, you know, what it means to know something, it means to know it in this particular way. Um, it means to know it scientifically and rationally and systematically rather than, um, you know, like like uh, like a, a shaman would know the the rainforest or something that's the example that uh santiago castro gomez ends up going to in his uh in his essay so i guess it's really really fascinating because it points out um a way it just points out a huge blind spot that i think people have and and um it's not an accident that's a blind spot it's a blind spot on purpose um so christianity capitalism colonialism and imperialism um they're all asserted as central (laughs) they're all asserted as the zero point and like the wreckage of these structures and ideology are basically invisible to people within them. So um, having decolonial theorists, having uh, other people uh, to point these things out is super helpful. Yeah, I think so. And I think that brings us to an important point here too, that, um, you know, one thing that you'll find when you start moving around like anti-imperialist spaces is that although imperialism has a really obvious economic and political um, piece to it, uh, there's also all these uh, epistemological or cultural pieces to it as well, right? That um, the in the process of extraction, in order to sort of build that uh, naturalization of the colonist, for example, or in order to um, try to uh, keep a sort of social order such that you can extract as much as you can, uh, there's also all kinds of strange ways in which uh, imperial centers export their own ideas um, and try to uh, force people to think the way that they think. Um, so there's this kind of weird way that that happens. Like uh, Ariel Dorfman, who's a um, Chilean author, wrote this really famous book about Donald Duck in Chile and how um, like Donald Duck uh, sort of like embodies all these wild ideas that people in the United States have about the rest of the world and also about how uh, capitalism makes you think. And it's this really fascinating sort of anti-imperialist read on how U.S. culture is trying to, like, make the world in such a way that everybody is ultimately, you know, a good subject for the United States in particular. Um, So pulling in that epistemological piece is useful uh, because you can't really understand imperialism, even if you want to understand the economy of it without getting that epistemological piece. But it's also useful for our own purposes because it pulls in the Christian side, right? That Christianity makes us think certain ways. Um, And sometimes those ways are like hidden from us. At least the Christianity of them is hidden from us. Uh, But you have to um, find what they are if you want to figure out how to get rid of them. Like you said earlier, you have to sort of name the demon if you want to exercise it. 
Yeah, I think that's right. Um, man, Donald Duck. What a bastard. <laughs> He's a bad one, that bad duck. <laughs> that bad duck. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, maybe it's worth sort of dwelling on this point a little bit more before we move on, though. Like, okay, so it's one thing to say that imperialism has this, like, Christian history to it that maybe isn't totally incidental, but, like, what's the point in talking about it now or making those links now? Like, how how can we sort of make the case that it's not uh, a point that's buried in the archive of history or something? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that's like, it's a big question, right? <laughs> but I think the, the thing that is really interesting and also insidious about these these ideas, though, is that if they're left, uh, if they're left undiscovered, untreated, unrecognized or unnamed or whatever, they are also like self reproducing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. So uh, it's not like they're going to just like fade out of um, they're not going to fade out of practice or popularity or uh, or whatever. Uh, because they uphold a particular status quo. They uphold a particular racial hegemony and class uh, hegemony. So it's not like these things are going to be let go of by the people who have power to let go of them. Um, It's a real matter, I think, of struggle over ideas, but also uh, of power. Yeah, I think, too, um, even if we look at, like, more contemporary examples, um, the shape of Christian, the Christianity of imperialism becomes clearer, too, because... Like, what nations are imperialist? Generally, they are Western Christian nations, you know, with some exceptions, like Japan in the early 20th century or whatever, but generally Christian countries. Um, That, I think, is telling and not incidental. Uh, And the further you get, even in our own time, you can sort of see how not subtle it is occasionally, right? Like, George W. Bush is maybe the person I always think about, um, perhaps just Mm -hmm. because of how old I am. But, like... um, you know, this is a person who uh, <laughs> embarked like shamelessly on a totally useless imperialist war. I mean, useless in in the sense that it was not necessary in some ways, but was extremely profitable for the United States. Um, embarked on this war in Iraq, and you know they couched it in all kinds of terms, right? They're bringing freedom to that region. They're um, taking down a dictator. They're doing all kinds of stuff. But every once in a while, George Bush would say things like, "Yeah, we're bringing the opportunity to to be." to have like Christian freedom, true Christian freedom in the Middle East, right? Like these are things that are not um, like cards they play close to their chest necessarily. Uh, We know too, Mm -hmm. following like the Trump administration, um, Christianity is a massive player in even going as far as to be able to like move the U.S. embassy in Israel to, you know, Jerusalem or something, right? An extremely politically Mm -hmm. incendiary thing to do. Um, would be like Trump himself has said, like he basically did it because it makes the Christians happy. Right. Um, So all that to say, like, yes, there's lots and lots of uh, political economic pieces to imperialism, but there are also these completely like bizarre forms of logic that uh, either dovetail with those interests or um, I don't know, are like profitable to serve, even if they're not profitable in a sort of strictly obvious economic sense immediately. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> whenever I think about about like contemporary Christian imperialism, we don't need to talk about this at length or anything. But um, uh, if you know anything about like weird evangelical stuff in Cuba, there's like this um, very bizarre um, like evangelical nonprofit called Echo Cuba that right. basically like is a sort of training ground for evangelicals in uh, in Cuba, and it's like you know funded in a lot of ways by Christian ministries in the United States. And like, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know enough about it to say if it's like directly, um, you know, trying to like overthrow the Cuban government or anything, but it is like importing a lot of extremely bizarre evangelical and like American ideas into Cuba. And uh, just like, I guess a, a weird example of a, of a way that Christian imperialism works as explicitly Christian. Yeah. Well, just a weird thing. I guess I'll try no, to say. We'll, we'll return to that. I think. Um, later on, because it's an important point that Christianity, okay, Christianity is a a sort of intellectual or epistemological or ideological infrastructure to imperialism today. Um, You know, it's this kind of thing that's like haunting our imperialist activity. Uh, It's like always coming alongside it, um, both because of history and also because of just the demographics of like imperialist countries. But also, it is like an extremely useful imperialist tool, <laughs> and we can mm-hmm. uh, talk more about that in a minute. 
Um, I think, though, this is maybe a good time to pivot to talking about one of the wildest things about Christianity's role in imperialism, at least to me. This is the thing that I often think about, for better or worse, I guess. And that's that Christian imperialism has weird effects on everybody in peripheral or oppressed places, which includes Christians in those places. So obviously, like the bad effects of imperialism are bad, whether they happen to Christians or not. So like, I'm not not trying to say just because it happens to these Christians, we should care more about it or something. But I want to point out there's this kind of like really dark irony about Christians in oppressed countries having to oppose the Christianity of imperialist countries or how like imperialist Christians by, you know, bombing an entire country to hell have made it even harder for other Christians to live in, in certain contexts because those people are reasonably understandably suspicious of Christians after getting bombed by them, you know, for several years. Uh, so I guess the, the point that we could sort of start talking about a little bit more is like how imperialism, how Christians being imperialists, actually uh, makes it difficult for other Christians, anti-imperialist Christians, to uh, do their thing, to like be good Christians in their own countries. Yeah, that's a really funny way to put it. Um, you know, just don't don't cause anyone to stumble. You'd <laughs> be better off with a millstone around your neck, you know? Um, <laughs> imperialist Christians, I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, hey, well, here, here's maybe an example that we could we could bring up to kind of illustrate the point and like the the weirdness of the point. Um, so a long time ago on this podcast, we talked about Christianity. We talked about Christianity and the DPRK. Um, we talked about it a few times, but um, well, hey, both those episodes, they're great. You should go listen <laughs> to them. Um, so, yeah, if you'll recall, Pyongyang, the capital, was once known as the Jerusalem of the East because uh, Christianity was spreading so rapidly there. Um, obviously, communism as an atheist movement put out plenty of propaganda against religion over time. Uh, that's true. Um, but they also didn't have to work that hard <laughs> at uh, creating that propaganda because um, the U.S. showed people what their Christianity did and didn't mean. Um, here's a quote from a, tw a 2018 article by Dae Young Ryu, uh, a a an article called Kim Il-sung and Christianity in North Korea in the Journal of Church and State. Um, it's pretty horrific, so brace yourself. One U.S. Air Force general commented, we burned down every town in North Korea. The relentless and indiscriminate American bombing hardly left a worthy target standing and produced a virtual holocaust. Thus, there was really no place for Christians to assemble for service because the U.S. bombers had destroyed all the religious facilities. Many Christians reportedly perished in the churches because they sought shelter there, believing that Americans would never bomb churches. In the end, the North Korean people regarded Christianity as only the religion of America their arch enemy and thus christians had to hide their religious identity um so just like dean said um you know communists you can accuse them of, of atheism and spreading atheist propaganda but like can you really blame them i guess um I, honestly like one of the most horrific things i've ever read um uh, about the bombing of the dprk it's really um i mean really scary really horrific a monstrous thing to do to a group of people and um, yeah, I think it demonstrates exactly what American Christianity has to offer. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I find so fascinating about Dayang Ryu, who's the scholar that we've looked at a few times on the show, is, you know, he, he's attentive to a more complex story about Christianity in the DPRK. And I really value that. Um, but what's so fascinating when he talks about the sort of propaganda against Christians is, like he said, um, it like it makes sense at a certain level. Uh, it's not to excuse it. I mean, lots of atheist propaganda against Christianity is like not good, right? <laughs> I'm not, not trying to say that it's, it's just fine or like totally deserved or whatever, because it's not. Um, and the, the Christians in North Korea themselves who were, you know, not imperialist bombers certainly don't deserve to be lumped in with the ones who were. But nevertheless, uh, one thing that Ryu goes on to say in, in I think this article or maybe another one, uh, is that a lot of Christians in North Korea ended up becoming like pre-patriotic and supporting the revolution because they themselves did not want to be associated with the imperialism of American Christians. And you can read that cynically as like a survival mechanism, but Ryu reads it authentically as saying, well, if people are bombing you, <laughs> like you're probably not going to want to be friends with them, right? Um, or not want to be associated with that kind of expression of your faith. 
And I think there's a lot to that, right? Uh, and that, that sort of dual point that on the one hand, um, U.S. Christian imperialism is bad because it, it does this kind of violence, um, even going as far as, you know, bomb churches and stuff like that. Uh, and on the other hand, it, it actually actively makes life worse for Christians in the places that, you know, Christians love talking about, like, the persecuted Christians in the DPRK um, without ever acknowledging that, like, one reason that that persecution may or may not be as prevalent is precisely because of U.S. Christians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, man, <laughs> sorry, just having, like, a very visceral moment over here thinking about how terrible this actually is. Yeah. Well, okay. It's sorry. Just gonna take a second to remove myself from that bad thought I was having. <laughs> sure. Um, it's not not just a problem in the DPRK. I've already mentioned it uh, already, Dean. But back in episode 109, we talked kind of extensively about uh, how ch uh, in China, as the Revolutionary War was happening, Christians created the Three Self Movement, which tried to create an indigenous and also anti-imperialist form of Christianity. Um, if you if you don't remember the, the episode, it's not on the top of your brain. Let me remind you: the three self principles of that movement in China were self governance, self support financially, and self propagation, or like you know missions. Um, and the point was that uh, Christians recognize foreign missions as tools of imperialism, uh, or Christians of the three self movement recognize foreign missions as imperial uh, imperialism. And if Christianity was authentic for Chinese people, then they shouldn't have uh, like any trouble building their sort of like own sect or denomination or expression of it i think it's a really interesting um example of of something that first of all christians in the west absolutely hate um you know if you uh you, you talk to a you talk to a christian in the united states who knows anything about china they're like well you know there's the there's the chinese church and then there's like the underground church or whatever <laughs> Um, and because they they hate the idea that they would there would be a Christianity or you know expression of Christianity that is not solely um, delivered to them by Western missionaries or something. So I, I mean, all of this to say, like, um, and this so you know the DPRK we have this example of um, Christians in, in the United States um, making life awful <laughs> for Christians in the DPRK um, and like awful in every single way you can imagine. But then uh, in, in response, like China has somehow like, you know, learned learned this lesson um, that uh, Christianity and probably just religion in general is a great sort of path for imperialism. So to get around that, they have um, found a very interesting anti-imperialist um, like expression of it. Well, it's probably worth saying like, OK, China does bad stuff with respect to religion, right? It's not not to say that they always yeah, do the right thing. Yeah, totally. It's not that they've got it figured yeah, out, right? exactly. And and that's true with Christians, too. Like, there, there's a long, very, very complicated, extremely frustrating, you know, sort of, like, zigzag history of Christianity in communist China. But um, one thing that you can say, and I think people should go out of their way to say because people don't, <laughs> is exactly what you're sort of pulling out here, that there there are anti-imperialist forms of Christianity that are indigenous to places that are on the receiving end of imperialism. And people view those things oftentimes, I think, as like, I don't know, like making a deal with the devil or being totally cynical about it, or these are just opportunists, or, or this is like just the state kind of creating a puppet church or whatever. But if you read people like K.H. Ting, for instance, who was a, a bishop in the Three Self Movement, that's not the kind of thing that you see. I mean, this is a person who's like very theologically sophisticated, someone who's really concerned about being a, a good Christian. And uh, for him, being a good Christian by extension means not supporting something like Western imperialism and, and trying to be vigilant about it and trying to understand that Christianity can be a vehicle for it. And, you know, how might you create a, a uniquely and appropriately Chinese form of Christianity? Um, not just so that the government doesn't get mad at you or something, but because, you know, that that's also a Christian thing to do. Um, and I think that's a, a, an important piece of thinking through the Christianity of imperialism and the Christianity of anti-imperialism. Um, you know, so it, it would be easy to, like, read a lot of examples of Christian imperialism and just write off Christianity as being, therefore, imperialist, and that's kind of all you have to say about it. Um, mm -hmm. But these kinds of groups, the Three Self Movement... Um, show that that's not the case right or even like ba like base communities yeah, yeah. or you know uh, or the the very specific example of uh, of um ernesto carnal and solentaname like these are really ex like uh, explicit examples of, of places where christianity is is turned and like you know people do something else with it yeah that is 
explicitly anti-imperialist or explicitly explicitly like liberative right yeah no but i i agree like uh the base communities are a great example um i think too about how like we did that episode on Assyrians, right? And like, that's mm. such a fascinating example as well of George W. Bush being a, a good Christian imperialist, uh, you know, totally ruining Iraq, um, making it certainly worse <laughs> at the very least. Um, and lots of Assyrian Christians understand that that's bad, right? You're not going to find a lot of uh, Assyrian or Yazidi Christians in Iraq who are like huge fans of George W. Bush. Um because why would you be like as a not only as a Christian, but just as a, a person in general, why would you be? And I think that's also just again, just a key piece is to see that Christian imperialism leaves also Christian victims among many, many other victims. Again, not trying to like single out Christian victims as being like uniquely important, but just uh, noting that sort of incredibly uh, frustrating irony. Well, it's it's important to point out because there's a certain way of thinking that like uh that Christianity is the thing that should trump, you know, nationality. Yeah. That that's what really matters, right? That Christians, um, it shouldn't matter what where you're from, that if you um if you're a Christian of any nation or whatever, that should be a uniting factor. But it's like so clearly not the case. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Or even I mean, even the example of the of Assyrian Christians in the United States, right? Remember we, there's that story a while back where they they came to the United States and they thought that maybe like um it, they would have some type of like I don't know, uh, solace here because of Trump and they were Christians, but then they were all just deported by mm-hmm. ice. So it's not like, um, it's not like that the, the Christian modifier is something that actually makes a difference, right. um, to, to imperialism. Yeah, it doesn't insulate you in a weird way. Right. Um, which goes to show too that, I mean, this is a whole nother point, but important to emphasize that Christianity, Western Christianity in particular, is a racializing narrative as well, right? And you can be caught in that whether right. you're a Christian or not, obviously. I mean, the Syrian case is one. You can talk about black Christianity, obviously. You know, the list goes on and on. Um, anyway, all that to say, it's bad. You got to get rid of it. Um, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> We should go back to that point that you were making earlier about Cuba, because I think that's maybe the last piece to add here, which is that Christianity is is easily weaponized by imperialism to subvert liberation projects. Um, there's lots of examples of evangelicals trying to undermine liberation theology, for, for instance, um, or like the U.S. intentionally exporting and supporting certain forms of evangelical Christianity, which they see as as breaking up links of solidarity in places like Brazil or like Cuba. Um, places where especially Catholic liberation theology has a really strong hold. Uh, we know that the U.S. government favors um, other kinds of more individualized forms of Christianity, more sort of pietistic, apolitical forms. And, you know, this is all stuff that's like <laughs> pretty straight from the horse's mouth on the books. Nobody's upset about it or feels ashamed of it. But it's, you know, it's a stated goal, um, understanding that liberation theology is a real force uh, to be reckoned with in a way that like evangelicalism can sort of um, upset that or temper it or whatever. And I think as Christians, especially who live in the imperial core, it's important to realize that we are literally exporting like forms of Christianity that are weapons uh, to keep people subjugated. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I'm just going to say it right here. I'm going to go on record and say it. That's bad, Dean. <laughs> that's a brave stance, um, but it's one I respect. And I appreciate you uh, just putting it that bluntly. A lot of, a lot of people are afraid to say that kind of thing these days. Yep. Yep. It was on record. I went on record and said it. I did it. And, uh, <laughs> and it sucks. I hate it. It sucks and I hate it, but it is real and happening. And, um, man, uh, to be a Christian in the United States means that you are implicated in that. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see. How can we conclude this in a way that doesn't feel like a massive bummer, even though it is a massive bummer? Um, <laughs> Let's see. I mean, it doesn't have to be a massive yeah. bummer, right? Like, um, you can be a Christian in the United States. You can feel convicted about these things, like you should. And then you can just, like, <laughs> you can just get into it, you know? <laughs> like, you could just be on the side of the people who your government is actively right. oppressing. That's right. That's the thing you could do. Yes, that's right. And that is an amorphous thing that you can do, though. Like, what does that mean? It means, just like we said last week, like, it might mean studying. It might mean uh, being a part of an organization. It might mean going to an anti-imperialist rally. Any of those things are probably good. 
But like, you can do that. <laughs> you could go and tell your pastor right now that this is what your new thing <laughs> is, and um, and and uh, feel convicted, but then do something. With yeah. It. Um, you know, oh, go, go to your uh, church's local mission board, and uh, when they're trying to decide what missionaries to support, tell them to find uh, some amazing anti-imperialist uh, Christian group that's holding out somewhere else against uh, U.S. imperialism. <laughs> Go to your local missions board, and when they're asking about uh, about missionaries, just tell them no, thank you. Just don't do it. Be like, uh, yeah, we should send just uh, checks to the Zapatistas. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we should just mm, pay people's bail. How about that? <laughs> Take all that missionary money and do something very positive with it. That's not. It's not uh, supporting meddling in other countries. I will say this: there are some missionaries that are extremely cool anti-imperialists. Um, you know, like the Mary Nullers have a, a history of that. Or uh, I've been hanging out with these guys here in Canada called the Scarborough Priests. They have a history of of that as well. So they're not all bad, but man, they're definitely not all good. They're more ba- they're more bad than good, but I agree with yeah. you. Um, if you're Protestant, then you're then you're definitely uh, in trouble. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know about any very good anti-imperialist Protestant missionaries, but maybe there's some out there. If there are any out there, please let me know, and I'll send you a mo- I'll send you money. I don't care. <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah. So I mean, maybe the big uh, th- those are the positive notes at least. But <laughs> here and then, let's bring it back down to a bummer because we do have to end on a bummer. Uh, contractually obligated. Um, so Christianity has brought imperialism into being. Imperialism has Christian roots, uh, has an, a, a Christian impetus. Um, read some decolonial theory and figure that out for yourself, maybe. Um, but uh, as Christians on the left, we have to take responsibility for that. Um, there's no way around it. We're, we are implicated, and that means um, can't just take the easy way out and saying, well, you know, we're the true... Me, me and my intentional community are the true anti-empire Christians against the fake uh, mega church imperial Christians. That doesn't work out um, because uh, because we we both benefit from the same structures that uh, that um, you know that Christianity has been a part of. S- seeing seeing that Christianity is is, is just oh, shit. Sorry, man. I'm having a hard time tonight oh, no reading problem. anything. So for Christians, we have to choose uh, instead. Uh, Instead of like choosing our own side or, tr- or choosing to take the easy way out, we have to choose to side with Christianity, knowing that it's not a pure and uh, a pure tradition that's like set apart, that it's already kind of already dirty and implicated in all kinds of bad things. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, when I when I think about that, I also think about Herbert McCabe, who we talk about on this podcast um, again, contractually obligated to mention him every six months or so, I guess. Uh, his uh, <laughs> famous essay, The Class Struggle in Christian Love, um, has this quote that I return to often, and I think more and more as I'm thinking about these kind of contradictions within Christianity, where he says, um, the Christian movement shattered itself as the Reformation by its involvement in the capitalist revolution. Kind of echoing in a different way the Benjamin point, I think. It is only mm-hmm. now with the end of the capitalist era that those wounds are being healed, now that they are irrelevant. We must expect the involvement of Christians in the socialist revolution to be no less traumatic for the churches. And I think it's that sort of idea that, uh, you know, this is a a real fault line within Christianity is important. That the fault line is no longer around, like, whether or not you baptize babies, because who cares? Nobody's going to kill you for it the way that they might have in the past. Um, (laughs) Now the fault line is, like, do you or don't you support, like, I don't know, some Canadian mining operation in Brazil, because if you don't support that, you will be killed for it. Um, Right. Like that's what happens on the ground. Uh, And I think that is at least one sort of like to talk in a Marxist sort of way. Right. One one Marxist kind of contradiction within Christianity that we have to sort of recognize and push and not not try to pretend that you can just resolve it within the system, but recognize that it can't be resolved um, within capitalism for sure. And uh, we need to sort of be willing to take the right side in that conflict. Yeah, I find that um, I find that McCabe quote pretty compelling, right? Like, um, I, I I don't know if you spend a few minutes on on Christian Twitter on a weird Christian Twitter, <laughs> just uh, soaking it all in, right? People are always having these like extremely esoteric theological discussions, and um, I often have a hard time understanding how they really apply to my life. But this uh, McCabe quote makes it make a little bit more sense, right? Um, 
it, it just like you said, no one's gonna, no one's gonna kill or persecute, persecute you uh, for believing that the spirit proceeds from the father or is co-equal to the father. No one is really fighting about that, at least not with guns. But, uh, but yeah, uh, the class war uh, and the way it presents itself within Christianity is still uh, extremely relevant. So there you have it. It will get you killed. <laughs> there you have it. Um, imperialism is bad. Uh, it, it has cut through Christianity and Christians are on both sides of it and you have to pick the right one or else we're never going to get rid of this big, dumb Christian product that we've let loose upon the planet. Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Um, we really appreciate everyone's uh, hard earned money and Patreon support. It really means a lot to us. It really makes this podcast um, worthwhile to us. And it's, it's really nice. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, our intro music, as always, is by Amari Armstrong, and our outro music is by The Illogical Spoon. Um, and don't be an imperialist. See you next week. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church, we'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation Never get tired, never bored Don't worry, someday There'll be no damn between us and our Lord Jackson, keep your hoods up Keep your hoods up And you stay up late Jackson, keep your hoods up Where you keep your hoods up and you stay up late Oh, don't mind a cold night But we might mind if you leave too soon So come on now, it's still early